chapter 23, and I'm assuming that some of you who have been in church before, uh, you have quite possibly heard Psalms 23. And we are going to go to verse 5, Psalms chapter 23, and we are going to read verse 5, Psalms chapter 23. Just one verse today, um, because here recently I, I have been having you read multiple verses. Uh, my ADD did kick in this week, and so that's why we're not in the book of Acts. Uh, but we are going to talk a little bit about Paul, but uh, being Communion Sunday, I want to shed a little bit different light on Communion because I think we all kind of understand the process and, and kind of why we do it uh, to an extent. But I truly believe, I, I truly believe that there is a great significance in the connection of communion from the first time until the last time. And I'm not sure many of us can make that connection, but after today, Lord willing, uh, we will be able to. Psalms chapter 23, uh, verse 5, since there's only one verse, will you please stand for the reading of God's word? Psalms chapter 23, verse 5. And it says, and this is David writing, Thou, and he's talking to God, he says, God, you prepare a table before me. You set it. You create it. You make it. In the presence of mine enemies. Notice something here. David is saying, God, you prepare the table, but the table is for mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Father God, I thank you so much for this day. I thank you for this service. Father, I believe truly that you have brought each and every person here today to divinely hear this word. Father God, I'm asking that everything that proceeds out of my mouth, dear Lord, uh, will come from your throne, dear Father. Father God, not any opinion or action of mine, but make sure, dear Father, you hide me behind the cross of Calvary and the word of God is preached the way it should be preached. Father God, I'm asking that you change hearts with this word. Father God, I'm asking that you lift up spirits with this word. Father God, I'm asking that you encourage with this word. Father God, I'm asking that you break chains with this word. And Father, let us leave this building not the same person we walked in. Father God, there is a dying world out there. And Father, I truly believe that somebody possibly walked in this building today feeling like they're dying themselves. But Father, you came to give life and to give it more abundantly. And my Bible is assures me, dear God, that where the word is preached, it will not return void. So Father God, I am relying on you to give life today. Father God, breathe anew in us today. Father God, make a new creation, a new vessel. Change us in your presence. In Jesus' precious holy name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. A very familiar passage of scripture for probably a lot of you, and if it's not familiar, then hopefully after today it will be familiar. Uh, if I had a title for today's message, it would be Set the Table. How many of you parents out there, and we probably don't do it as often today as we used to, but one of the chores that you would give maybe somebody in your house, you would say, you need to go set the table. Do I have any table setters out there? Yeah, way to pass it off on somebody else, right? <laughs> and usually what had happened in my house when we used to set the table, it would be Heidi, go set the table. And because she was older than me, she would relay the message, hey, Joel, go set the table. <laughs> and so usually the youngest one got the opportunity to set the table, and it became a chore to them. It's amazing how the older you get, the more you get to delegate. And that's what I learned in, in my house. I'm thankful that Rachel's younger than me because I get to delegate all the time. <laughs> and Lord willing, she'll never catch up to my age, and she'll never pass me because I've become a very good delegator in our marriage of three years. And so here, God is talking with David, and David is talking with God, and David looks up and says, God, you set the table in the presence of my enemies. See, whenever a table is set, there is a preparation being done for a meal that is being anticipated, because who in the world would set the table without a meal being in the oven? It would make zero sense to set the table in the morning and the meal not happen to the next day. So David wrote in Psalms 23, thou sets a table before me, but I found it ironic that when David was setting the table or when God was setting the table for David, notice what David says, God, you're setting the table in the presence of mine enemies. 
Let me tell you something today, church. Last week I was very tired. I feel pretty good today, so you need to hold on to your seats yeah. because I think there's going to be a word here that's going to uplift you. Listen, God said, I'm setting the table, David, in the presence of your enemies. Can I tell you something? As a promise today, what comes against you comes against God. Amen. What offends you offends him. Amen. And when you can't fight the enemies by yourself, my God says your enemies are my enemies. Hallelujah. And I need to remind you today, don't take things personal when things come against you because God's got your back. And David was saying, thou set a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Dad, you need to go do your work because I got some dudes coming against me that I can't handle. And God looks down at you as his children and says, I've got it because your enemies are my enemies and vengeance is not yours, but whose? It is the Lord. So what they're doing yeah. to you, you can stand back and you can rest assured that God will take care of his own. I'm all about God being of love and mercy and grace. But my God is also righteous, he is also holy, and he will also have vengeance on those who come against his children. And I take comfort in knowing that the darkness that tries to defeat me one day will be defeated at the hands of my God. Amen. Hebrews 10, 31 says that it, that it is a bad thing for someone to fall in their hands of an angry God. And David was saying, God, there's some people coming against me. Let them go ahead and fall into your hands and watch what happens with them. My enemies is his enemies. Your enemies is his enemies. <coughs> Church, you can take comfort in knowing that what's coming against you is not coming against you alone. Don't take it personal because my Bible says they persecuted Christ. They'll also persecute, persecute you. But my God overcame persecution in himself and he'll overcome it with you. His enemies, my enemies. And so I started thinking, okay, God's enemies are our enemies, and he's going to take care of us, and he's going to fight this battle for us. But why a table? That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. The last thing that I want to do when the enemies are surrounding me is to sit down at a table. But I don't think David dreamt this up. I believe he had to have some type of reference to draw this conclusion from. <clears throat> Here's what I need to remind you of. In biblical days when war was waged, there were basically two outcomes that would happen. Number one, you would be killed. Plain and simple. Number two, many times the victors in battle would not kill their enemy that they've overcome, but they would enslave them. And so when David is looking and he's seeing his enemy all around, David knows that there are only two options that are going to happen here. The outcome's either going to be I'm killed by my enemies or I'm enslaved by them. And he's saying, God, I need your help. I need your holy presence. And God says, let's set a table. God, I'm not, I don't want to set a table. We've got work to do. We've got war to wage. God, the presence of the enemy is surrounding me. Listen, I begin at this point when David was writing this song, he was probably beginning to doubt whether victory was going to be given to him or not. And then he looks up at the father and the father says, I'm going to set a table for you. God, I don't need a table. I need some lightning bolts. Amen. Come on, you know, right? I, I don't need a table. I need some thunder. I need yeah. you to open up the earth and let them fall in. I need you to fall like let fire fall down. I need to let a hurricane come. I need, yeah. God, I need something. I don't need a table in the presence of my enemy. I can't sit down and eat. Yeah. I surely ain't hungry right now, God. I believe David probably began to prepare himself for defeat. You know how it is when you think the outcome that you're getting ready to go through is going to be negative? What do we all do in life? We begin to emotionally and mentally prepare ourselves. Have you ever been to a situation where you're getting ready to go somewhere or go in somewhere or be somewhere and you think the outcome of that meeting or you think the outcome of whatever's happening is going to be negative, so you go in there negative because you want to be prepared for the negativity? Do you know what I'm talking about? Like you look, you got something marked on your calendar, you know that's going to be a really bad day. So mentally you're preparing for that bad day. And, and I believe this is kind of what David was doing. Because obviously in Psalms 23, he wrote earlier, Yea, they all walk through the valley of the shadow of death. This wasn't like the sunshine, rainbows, and unicorn day. This was the valley of the shadow of death. That David was preparing himself to think that the enemy was going to overcome him. And he looks up at God and says, the presence of the enemy is all around me. I turn to the left, and there they are. I turn to the right, and there they are. And you put a table in the middle of it. God, I don't want that seat. See, I think sometimes what we have convinced ourselves 
And it's funny because we, stand this, we sung the song, Stand in Your Love. Can I tell you something? I'm not good at standing in the presence of my enemies. I can tell you that right now. You say, well, what do you mean, Joel? When I see my enemies all around, I like to run the other way. I don't like conflict. I don't like controversy. I just like to go to my room and pray. And if I can't pray, I just watch TV, right? <laughs> I, don't want, I, don't want, I don't like running into my enemies. When I see an enemy in the supermarket, I go down the other aisle. When I see an enemy at the gas station, I keep going even though my light's on. When I see an enemy at work, I shut my door like I'm on the phone even though I'm not. I don't like enemies. I don't like having them. And that's superficial enemies. I don't have to worry about them taking my life. David was saying, God, they're going to take my life. I'm not good at standing in the presence of them. And then I thought, well, why in the world then did God give David a table? Because the last time I, I checked, none of us are standing at the table. Usually you're sitting. And probably in those days, the table was even lower than our normal table. I don't think they pulled up chairs per se. I think they sat all the way down on the ground. So why would God look at David and say, in the presence of your enemy, you need to sit? Well, let me tell you something. Sitting there is, when you're sitting, there is a sense of authority. Because if you are able to sit in the presence of your enemy, you're saying, I'm not concerned with this. I'm not worried about this. I'm not second guessing the outcome of this. I'm sitting in authority because I know God's got this. And you say, well, Joel, how do you draw that conclusion? My Bible says that the Savior is sitting on the right hand of God. He's not worried about this earth. He's not worried about tomorrow. He's not worried about your test results. He's not worried about your sickness. He's not worried about your enemies because my Bible says that he sits because he's already made the earth his footstool. He's not getting up for these little minute things that we worry about. He's got it under control. He's not worried about yesterday. Day. He's not worried about today, and he surely isn't worried about tomorrow. He's got it. So he's sitting there in his recliner, his foot propped up on his enemy, saying, I've got this under control. David, sit down at the table. See, I, I'm not good at standing, nor am I good at sitting, but that's what God's doing right now. He's not worried that our moral conduct, conduct has fallen. Does it concern him? Absolutely. Is he worried? Absolutely not. I don't believe my God works because he's sitting at the right hand. And the next time he decides to get up, he will understand what truly victory is. Because when he gets up the next time, you and I are out of here. Because the dead in Christ will rise first. And then you and I are going in the sky. And we will not have to worry either or be concerned about anything that we're concerned with today. Right now, God's just sitting up there, relaxed in the presence of his enemy. He's sitting at the table. And so here he is, and God's looking at David, and he's saying, you need to sit at the table in the presence of your enemies. There's no need to worry about this. But I think then David also must have had a particular event that he drew this conclusion from. And so you need to go back, and we're going to get you. If you don't shout with me today, something's wrong with you. I'm going to pray for your soul. <laughs> you need to go back to the first time that God prepared a table in the presence of your enemies. In Exodus chapter 12. In verse 1, let me take you to the story. The Hebrew children, the Israelites, were in captivity through the Egyptian people. And you remember that guy Moses that God rose up and he called Moses to go into the land of Egypt and to set his people free. And God did nine plagues trying to get Pharaoh to let his people free. And the enemy was holding on to them. Have you ever been there in life where you feel like you have prayed for plague after plague after plague from God that he would help you get released from the chains that the enemy has you bound, bounded in? And then all of a sudden, it just seems like every time you pray, the enemy just won't let go of you. Every time you turn around, he's there. Every time you wake up, you're in the valley of the shadow of death. It's a sad affair when God's children are in captivity. I can tell you today that some of us call ourselves children of God and we're in as much captivity as the children of Israel were in Exodus. Some of us have lost our ability to walk in freedom. We forget what freedom feels like. We forget what freedom tastes like. We forget what freedom is about. Some of us have never experienced the freedom that God can give because we truly haven't turned our lives over to Him. We turn over pieces to Him. We turn over aspects of Him. But we don't turn over everything to Him. And here, here are the children of 
Israel in the land of Egypt in Exodus chapter 12 verse 1 it says while they were still in Egypt well, what does that mean so it means that while they were still in captivity while they were still being bound by the chains of the enemy while life was still bad while the night was still strong while darkness was still prevalent they were still getting beaten they were still being slaves and they had nine plagues that went through the land and the enemy said no I will not release you some of you have fasted and you've prayed and you've asked God to deliver you from something and the enemy has said no. You've pleaded on your behalf. You've fasted. And a battle still wages in your life and the enemy says no. And then finally, God comes down in Exodus chapter 12 verse 1 and says while you are still in Egypt, while you are still in Egypt, I've had enough. You say, well, what has he had enough of? Well, God says, I'm going to send a, a tenth plague. A tenth plague, yes, a tenth plague. Because while you're still in Egypt, we're going to go ahead and plot and plan for the victory. While you're still in Egypt, we're going to go ahead and sort out your exodus. While you're still in Egypt, we're going to go ahead and plan your deliverance. While you're still in Egypt, we're going to go ahead and begin to shout for the morning's coming. While you're still in Egypt, we're going to set a table. You say, well, what do you mean? Well, God came down and said, and I'm going to speak death to your enemy. And because I'm speaking death to your enemy, I'm speaking deliverance to you. And when he came down and he said, here's what the 10th plague is going to be about. I'm going to send a death angel throughout the camp. And I'm sure when the, when the people of Israel heard that, I believe they shouted with joy. Oh, praise God, the death angel's coming. Let me get my sword. I'll walk behind him. We will slay these Egyptians because there is power in the sword. Can I tell you something? There is power in the sword. But there is also very undeniable power in the lamb. You say, well, what do you mean? When God said the death angel's coming, he said, leave your sword aside and grab your lamb. They said, well, what, what, God, what are you talking about? God said, well, we don't need the sword. You need to go ahead and grab your lamb. Can I tell you something? Something in our Bible says that our tongue is sharper than swords yeah. and the words that come out of our mouth give life or death. How many times do we grab our tongue to try to defeat our enemy when we should leave our tongue to silence and grab the lamb because that's where the undeniable power comes from. Yeah. And so God comes down and says, yeah. leave your swords in their sheath. You need to grab a lamb. He said, well, what do you mean, God? Here's what's going to happen, you children of Israel. You're going to grab the lamb, a perfect lamb. And you're going to sacrifice it. And you're going to feast upon it. And once you're finished feasting, you're going to apply the door. We'll apply the blood to the door. While you're still in the presence of your enemy. We're setting the table. You set that table. And you grab that lamb. And you apply that blood while you're still in Egypt. You plan the victory. You plan the exodus while you're still in Egypt. You make sure that you get ready to go because when liberation comes, you're out of here. Make sure that you set the table. But how do you know that they were preparing to leave? Exodus 12, 11 says that once you set the table, I need you to gird your loins, I need you to get your shoes, and I need you to get your staff. Because once the table is set, it's only a matter of time that your breakthrough is coming. And when your breakthrough comes, you're getting out of this land of Egypt. But the table has to be set first, church. And I have found that in our life, too many times we try to wait on the victory to come before we get our shoes and we get our staff. We wait for the victory to come to set the table. But God's saying set the table and prepare yourself for the victory because victory is inevitable when Christ is on your side. And your enemies are his enemies. And his enemies cannot stand when the blood is applied. Go ahead and feast, children, because joy comes in the morning. This is going to be a, a dark, dark, but joy. Go ahead and sit at the table. It's prepared for you. And the next morning, in the presence of your enemy, since the table is set, once you have feasted, we're walking out of here together, but you've got to set it first. And so at that point in Exodus, they had the very first Passover meal, the very first communion, the very first Lord's Supper. And the children of Israel ate of the lamb, and they applied the blood, 
And the next morning after the death angel had went through the camp and killed every firstborn of the Egyptians, the children of Israel walked out of there. But that table was set before the victory was ever given. And so they set the table. They enjoyed the meal. And then they had their breakthrough. Fast forward now to Matthew chapter 26. Christ has lived a perfect life. His time has come to die. He's still in Egypt. He's still in Egypt, church. He's still in this world. He hasn't conquered death yet. He hasn't conquered sin yet. He hasn't done any of that yet, but he's getting ready to. And he looks at his disciples and says, my time has come, but before I leave you, I need you to go into this town and you need to meet this man and you need to tell him we're getting ready to have communion. We're going to celebrate the Passover together. And when you get there, that man's going to say, oh yeah, I've got an upper room. The table's already set. You can use it. See, God had that man set the table because Jesus himself knew that the victory was only a few short days away. The table was set while sin was still strong, while death was still strong, but the victory was inevitable and the table had been set. So Jesus looked at his disciples and said, go find the upper room. There's a table set. Oh, amen. And the disciples went. They found the man. They found the table. And they went back to their Savior and said, yeah, yeah, the ta there's, a, there's a table set for us. Jesus said, I had that table picked out before I ever came to earth. See, in your life, the enemies that you're fighting, God already has a table picked out for you that you're going to eat your breakthrough meal before you even realized you had an enemy. And so the table in a lot of our lives have been set, and a lot of us are afraid to sit down in it because we are surrounded by the presence of our enemies. But I praise God that when our enemies are the strongest, the table is the strongest as well. So Jesus went and he got his disciples and they went to the upper room. And he sat down at the table. Surrounded by sin that had not been conquered. Surrounded by death which had not been conquered. Surrounded by a man named Judas who was a traitor. And Jesus sat there at a table set literally in the presence of his enemy. I don't know about you, I would have had a hard time looking across the table and seeing Judas. Who I gave everything to. I was getting ready to die for him. I came to earth for him. I called him and he lived his life with me for 30 some years. And in the presence of his enemy. Because without Judas there would not have been a betrayal. But we know the scriptures had to be fulfilled. So Jesus sat down at a table in the presence literally of his enemy. And they ate. I would have been sick on my stomach if I was him. Knowing that that man was getting ready to leave and to turn me over. And because of, he was, because of that, I was going to face the most gruesome death at the time. But God had a table set in the presence of his enemy. And they sat there. And they broke the bread. And this time, Jesus turns or makes a different twist on this Passover, this communion. See, if you follow it, we know that it started with the children of Israel in Exodus. David talks about it in Psalms. And now it's literally being fulfilled in Matthew. And Jesus looks at the disciples and he breaks the bread. And he says, this is my body. This is my blood. This body is broken for you. That included Judas at the time. And he looked at him and said, this is my blood, which was shed for you. <laughs> and when he did that, they were feasting on the lamb. Think about Exodus now, chapter 12. Jesus looks down and says, don't grab your swords, eat fully of the lamb. And here they are now, and Jesus breaks the bread and says, I am the body. This is me. He was the Lamb of God, the perfect one. And he looks at him and says, feast upon the Lamb. And then he gives him a cup and says, apply the blood to your life. It is fulfilling what Exodus was talking about. But it, it, it gets even better because after that, after they feasted on the Lamb and after they applied the blood, they were getting ready for a break. 
watch this. In Matthew 26, 52, they're in the garden now. So they feasted on the lamb. They applied the blood. They get to the garden. And Jesus is there praying. And the soldiers come to take him away. And Peter slices off the soldier's ear. And Jesus puts it back on and says, those who live by the sword, die by the sword. Peter, we're not grabbing swords. They're grabbing the lamb. In Exodus, God looked down at the people and said, put your swords away on this 10th plague. You're not grabbing the swords. You've got to grab your lamb. And the enemy came in the garden, and when they grabbed the sword, God said, no. Let him grab the lamb. And he willingly allowed himself to be led out of the garden because he knew that there was power in the sword, but all there was chain-breaking power in the lamb. There was earth-shaking power in the lamb. There was sin-shattering power in the lamb. There was, oh, listen to me, church. When the soldiers grabbed a hold of the lamb in the garden, they were fulfilling what Exodus 12 was talking about. When Jesus looked at Peter and said, put down your sword. You're not going to live and die by the, the sword. You're going to live and die by the lamb. Amen. And they took the lamb. They hung him on the cross and they feasted upon him. They mocked him. They spit upon him. They cried out and said, let the blood fall on our children. Exodus 12. Grab your lamb. Feast on the lamb. Apply the blood. Matthew, the soldiers, grabbed the lamb. They feasted upon him. They humiliated him. And then they cried out, let the blood fall on our children. And they right there were partaking in a communion. They were partaking in a Passover. And they didn't even realize it, church. Because when the blood hit their children, the Father, God said, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. When the blood was applied to their lives, he was asking for forgiveness at the same time. And that blood would be what changed them forever. So the table had been set on the cross. The lamb had been feasted upon. The blood had been applied. And when the table is set, breakthrough comes in the morning. And three days passed. And the earth began to shake. And the heavens began to open up. And the stone was rolled away. And because the table was set in the presence of enemies, a breakthrough came on that Sunday morning. And because of it, you and I can walk in freedom, not because of the sword, but because of the power of the Lamb of God, church. There's breakthroughs when tables are set. Joel, what are you saying? I'm saying that some of you today are in the presence of your enemies. Some of you are feeling humiliated. Some of you are feeling discouraged. Some of you have your doubts. Some of you feel like giving up. And instead of trying to stand there by your own might, God says sit down and set the table and get ready for the breakthrough because once the table gets set, the breakthrough is only right around the corner. Stop trying to fight this. These are not your enemies. These are my enemies. And I've got your back. And vengeance is mine. And I'll take care of my own. And I put you in my hand. And there's nobody going to pluck it out. I've got to sit down and watch me do my thing. I've taken this under control. We need to just sit at the table. But I need to figure this out. Sit at the table. But I need to stand. Sit at the table. And when we get ready to partake of this communion today, Communion, obviously, is always a holy reverent time. But I want you to look at it this way. When Jesus sat at the table with his disciples, he was sitting still in the presence of his enemy, and he knew while he was partaking of it, there was only a matter of time until his enemies would be put to death. And that was sin because he was getting ready to conquer it. That was death because he was getting ready to destroy it. It was only a matter of time once that table was set. So I'm sure there were all kinds of emotions going through the Savior's head in that upper room. But he ate knowing that victory was only three days away. I praise God that he sat at the table because he could have called 10,000 angels. And he could have went back up to heaven and said, forget about this. But he sat at the table knowing not worried about the cross, but he knew the glory that followed would be worth the shame that it brought. Here's what I'm telling you today.
today as those playing music come forward. Here's what I want you to know today. Don't eat of the communion today because your life is all in order. Eat knowing today that God has a table set. Amen. Don't eat today knowing that you're on the mountaintop, but eat today because you're in the valley. Don't eat today knowing that you're surrounded by wonderful people all the time in your life and everything's glorious. No, eat today that you're living your life despite the plans of the enemies. Because even though weapons may be fashioned against you, they shall not prosper. Eat today knowing that you haven't tasted a victory, but victory is only right around the corner. Eat today because not because you're free from everything in your life, but you know that freedom's on its way. Church, this is a victory meal that you're getting ready to partake in. You're eating knowing that the enemy's all around and you're sitting at the table knowing there's nothing they can do to you because your enemies are his enemies. Eat today because of victory. Not because you're walking in it. Eat today knowing that it's coming. Hallelujah. Paul wrote in Corinthians, and here's how we'll tie Paul in with this. Paul understood all this because when he wrote, he said, when you do this, he said, do it in remembrance of him. Do it in remembrance of the Savior who sat at the table. Do it in remembrance of the Savior who set the table. Do it in the remembrance of the Savior who, despite the presence of your enemies, still told you to sit down because the battle doesn't belong to you. It belongs to him. Do it despite everything that's went wrong in your life. Eat of it anyway. Before you can do that, though, he did give a command. He said, before you can partake of this, you've got to turn it all over to him. Because Judas sat at the same table but he wasn't willing to turn it all over to him. <clears throat> some of you have turned some over to him. Some of you have turned 85% over to him. But for so many of us, and I'll include myself in this, there's like that one aspect in your life where you just don't want to sit down at the table because you're afraid. If you sit and you have to rely on God, what if he doesn't show up? God sent the tables there, right there in the presence of your enemies. And I'm waiting for you to sit down with me and eat. Because even though you don't see all those around you, there's way more for us than against us. So just eat. Just eat. Just eat. He said, this is my body, which was broken for you. You. Despite all your flaws, his body was broken for you. Despite all your failures, his body was broken for you. He said, this is my blood which was shed for you. And they had that table set. And they feasted one last time. And Jesus looked at his disciples and said, listen, the next time we eat, we're going to eat in the kingdom on the other side. So I'm going, and I'm going to sit down, and I'm still sitting. My Bible, it's Jesus is still sitting, and he's sitting at the table just waiting for his saints. And whether death calls you home or God says stand up for a second and go get him, there will come a day that we'll all sit one more time at the table. Because the promise that Jesus gave the disciples, he said, I'm not going to drink or eat with you again on this side of glory. But you wait to the other side of glory. There's a table set. And you haven't experienced that victory yet, but one day you will. But make sure you truly feast of the Lamb. Make sure you truly apply the blood. And make sure you're truly born again. Because if you are, there's a chair for you at the table. A table set every head bowed and every eye closed. Paul wrote in Corinthians that before you partake of the Lord's Supper, that you examine your hearts. You examine them. 
You make sure that whatever's in there is covered by the blood. Didn't say you had to be perfect. He said you make sure that whatever's in there has been given to the Savior. I want to put you on the spot. Keep your eyes closed and head bowed. 